All right. How are we doing, guys? We're live. We're doing a Facebook Live. Um, kind of an impromptu one. It wasn't necessarily planned. So I'm going to start right off the gate here. Um, but we got a lot to talk about. Uh, there's been... There's been some conversations online. Uh, a lot of the Facebook groups are, are chiming in on this on these topics, and I thought it'd be a good opportunity to kind of step in and 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 really kind of throw a little bit of a little bit of information at you. Uh, I, most folks who are into personal watercraft and jet skis, they're never going to crack their engine open, and they're really not expected to even tinker with it. Uh, most, most manufacturers, most dealers, they really don't want you messing with your, with the engine. They want you to go to the dealer or to a, a, a certified technician and just have that guy do the work on, on your watercraft. So when it comes to these kinds of questions, um, especially for a guy who's, who's not a gearhead, a guy who doesn't turn wrenches, a guy who doesn't mess with this kind of stuff, um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of mystery there's a lot of voodoo that they just don't understand so uh, today we're going to touch on uh, some topics that uh, might be a little higher level um, I'm gonna I'm gonna have some fun we're actually going to use this as our example of a jet ski engine so hang hang with me on this one you're gonna have to you have to put on your imagination <laughs> your imagination cap um, but I thought it'd be a good opportunity to uh, sit down and talk a little bit about uh, modern engine performance, getting the most out of your engine, preserving the life of your engine, what manufacturers have done to help preserve engine life, and then really what you can do in the future to make sure that you're getting the optimal performance out of your personal watercraft. And this is regardless if you're a supercharged machine or naturally aspirated. Uh, I'll, get into the, I'll get into the nuts and bolts on that a little bit deeper. Uh, let me grab something really quick. Um, all right. So <clears throat> we wanted to talk about, and there were some questions that were coming up, and I'm just gonna kind of jump head first into the <laughs> into the shallow end here. Um, basically, the questions were coming up on like the Sea forums and the Sea groups on Facebook. Was hey, I've got a supercharged 230, you know, uh, like a 1630 GTRX or I mean a GTR 230, excuse me. And um, Cedar recommends that I can run 87. Uh, and is that okay? Cause it's a supercharged ski. And I didn't know if that was all right. And then some guys are, and, and there's been a lot of misinformation. There's been a lot of old wives tale and a lot of oh, some old wives tales about engine technology. And then what's scary is that there's been a lot of shade tree mechanics or, or throwing out some bad information. So we're uh, let me just kind of jump right into it. Is first let's talk about gasoline. All right. So uh, today's gasoline is not like yesterday's gasoline, and by yesterday's gasoline, I mean basically pre OPEC year or, or the, the OPEC crisis of 1973 to 1975. Uh, these are the oil producing nations. Um, Prior to, prior to the you know the gas crunch or gas crisis of the 70s, gasoline uh, could be uh, was was primarily offered with a very heavy lead content, all right, and that lead content was fantastic for engine performance. And what that lead content did was that liquid that molly lead was actually coating a lot of the internals. Your 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 pistons, your piston rings, your valves, your valve seats, and what that was, what that lead helped do was that it was softening a lot of the impact and harmonics that happen inside of a combustion chamber. All right, and there's and they added to the wear and tear. Um, that lead was actually helping to preserve uh, some of the materials, some of the more ferrous materials that were used inside of old engines. And um, as a guy who likes screwing around with old engines, I can tell you it worked, especially because the technology of the metals, the actual metallurgy of those engines were 
light years behind what we have today. All right, a brand new Honda Civic has an engine 10 times more efficient than the most badass big block Corvette or Hemi Mopar or, you know, big block or even a you know, high revving small block Ford from Detroit in the 1960s and 70s. It really is. I mean, efficiency, efficiency is one thing. I'm not saying they're making more horsepower. I'm saying efficiency, cleaner burn, more efficient burn, less waste. Okay. So just, I'm, I'm going to go slow. I'm going to try to walk through a lot of my points here. So kind of, you know, hang on, <laughs> hang on for a ride here. So, um, when OPEC and then the EPA started making these changes to domestic gasolines, they removed, uh, they removed the lead content. All right. And then you started seeing additives being sold over the shelf that were these octane boost, these lead additives, because a lot of the old engines simply did not have the, the, the right kind of piston material. The rings would wear out without that extra lead. So you're seeing people having to pour, you know, a little bottle of STP, you know, remember Richard Petty with the big STP on his 73, 74 chargers. Um, and then he raced Monte Carlos in the late seventies and the eighties. Okay. So STP was that fuel additive and that oil additive, and that was to help preserve engine performance. Okay. And that was because the technology of the metals being used in engines at that time were, had not caught up to the gasoline. Okay. Gasoline without that lead was actually causing a lot of wear and tear on engines. And you were starting to see, especially during the eighties, they were the old gas clunkers. They were the clunkers. They knock and they rattle. And, th and when you turn the ignition off, they diesel. You know, they sit there and they keep. Um, uh, I just recently rewatched for like the hundredth time Vacation with Chevy Chase. He goes out and he buys the brand new Vista Cruiser, or the uh, he tra traded in his Oldsmobile Vista, Vista Cruiser and he, Vista Cruiser, and he got the uh, family truckster, and and it's brand new. And the car just sits there and diesels on the driveway for like five minutes. All right, that was because the engines quite frankly, were, were not tuned enough. They were not efficient enough to lean burn that gasoline. Okay, so today we have better materials in our engines. Okay, your Yamaha engine, your Sea-Doo engine, your Cowie engines, they're more efficient, they have better materials. Okay, and materials is one thing, and I'm, I'm getting into the materials for a reason. All right, the materials, first are going to last longer. They can actually stand up to the actual wear and tear of an internal combustion. All right. Though that, that explosion is going off. I mean, if you're a hot rodder, you're going, you know, 7,000, 8,000 RPM and that's happening. 8,000 explosions are happening <laughs> in one minute. I mean, this is, I mean, that's, that's crazy. If you think about it, you really wrap your head around that. So that piston's got to hold up and those piston rings got to hold up and those valves and those valve seats have to hold up. Everything about that's got to hold up. So you're looking at heat, you're looking at durability and then you're looking at heat dispensation. Where's the heat going? All right. How does the engine get that heat out of there? Because obviously you don't want that glowing hot because that melts, but how do you get rid of that heat? All right. So it's engine cooling. Uh, a few videos ago, we talked about the changes that Kawasaki made to its 1.5 liter in 2014. They added a second cooling circuit. They added uh, larger oil, uh, uh, larger oil circuits and oil jetting and additional oil jetting. And then they added, they opened up the water circuits so that the circuit itself, I know we've, in our head, we colloquially think of circuit as being electronic, but I'm talking about the route, the circulation of water going through the engine. And they opened up that route of, of water circulation through the engine. So anyhow, anyhow, again, if I'm going too fast, someone scream, throw their hand up, let me know, I'll go back, I'll backtrack. Okay, so they improved their, their uh, 
internal operating temperature management. All right, ITC, internal uh, internal temperature control. Okay, uh, but ITC is a, is a common it's a common colloquial that you see with a lot of engine builders, a lot of um, architecture, you know, engine architecture. Um, so, anyways. Uh, Kawasaki did this in 2014. Yamaha has done a, a lot of, you know, has done a lot of really good work in, when it comes to uh, engine operating temperature and in, in engine management. And of course, Sea-Doo with its new Ace motors. Um, and especially for 2020, they had they got rid of all their 1503 smaller three cylinders, and they all went to the larger displacement 1630 Ace engines. Um, uh, right outside on my on my back in my backyard patio, I've got uh, a GT a GTI SE 170 that has the larger displacement 1630 170 horse engine. Um, now, what's interesting, uh, uh, when it comes to these kinds of materials, improved materials, and uh, 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 that are more durable and can dissipate, dissolve reroute heat better okay um we start seeing that engines are getting more mileage okay and that's for efficiency all right it's not about horsepower all right horsepower torque those are increments of measurement regarding how much power it makes i'm not talking about that right now what i'm talking about is efficiency how well do how well does the engine do its job? And I'll tell you what, an engine does not care if it's a Ford, Chevrolet, Chrysler, Yamaha, Sea-Doo, Kawasaki. It does not care. It doesn't care how many cylinders it's got. It doesn't care. All it cares about is being an air pump. Sucks in air, pushes air out. And the byproduct is power, okay? And it could be a diesel, it could be a two-stroke, it could be a four-stroke. It does not matter. All an engine is, it could be a jet engine for goodness sakes. All it wants to do is suck in air and push air out. That's all it's doing, okay? And so what you have to look, how you really judge an engine is by its efficiency. How well does it do its job? So let's talk about personal watercraft when it comes to gasoline today and what do you do? All right, octane, I don't want to go into the nitty gritty about octane ratings and all the additives and all the different things that are in gasoline today. That could take us about three hours. I don't think I've prepared well enough and I think I'd have about two viewers. So let's just move on. Okay. But octane rating, most Tom, Dick and Harry knows that 87 is the cheap stuff and 91 or 93 is the good stuff. All right. That's the super. And then you have your regular, your mid-grade, and your super, all right? And then you start getting into like 106, 108, 112. That's race gas, okay? Now, what the octane rating is, quite frankly, is, and I'm going to, you got, the tech guys and the guys who know this stuff, you're going to laugh at me and you're going to say, Kevin's an idiot. But I'm going to put this in really, really basic layman's terms, is that the higher the octane rating all right, the more combustible it is, the less waste and the more combustible it is, the bigger boom, okay? So 87 is kind of sloppy, kind of messy gasoline, all right? It doesn't burn really well. It doesn't burn very cleanly. 93 octane burns cleaner, all right? And it ignites easier, okay? So let's just take that for what it is. Now, here's the interesting thing. Over the last 18 to 22 years, they, uh, um, oil producing nations as well as the U.S. has been, and primarily because of pressure from the EPA, has been adding ethanol to fuel. All right, whether that's bioethanol, corn, you know, corn gas, or that's done through sugarcane. Um, for example, uh, I believe it's Brazil. Brazil is almost entirely ethanol, and they make their own ethanol using sugar. All right. And hey, that's great. And they're, and they're doing a really good job with it, okay? But what they find out is that ethanol 
all right and why ethanol has a dirty has a dirty name when it comes to performance engines is that ethanol has a lot of uh, h2o in it it, has, it one of the byproducts is that in the combustion process um, already in, in, in a static dormant state there's already a lot of moist there's a lot of water in ethanol then when it burns there's still a lot of those bonds all right there's still a lot of the molecular bonds of 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 water in that okay now it's not enough to quote unquote hydraulic your your engine but what it is, what it does do is that a lot of high performance engine guys have found that high ethanol count fuel quickly corrodes a lot of engine internals how can that be well, that happens, and this is actually really funny, is that the, the people really complaining about that are hot rodders, old school hot rodders, uh, you know, old guys with more gray in their beard than I do, all right, guys who are building engines like this, drag racers, things like that, and they, they're complaining because it's eating up their rings, it's eating up their bearings, um, it's eating up their valves. And it's because they're cheap bastards <laughs> and and they don't want to spend the money on really high-end quality coated stuff all right like i said a brand new honda civic a toyota corolla whatever the heck i mean i'm talking cheapo cars you buy off a lot today have really nice coated material i mean they have coatings on their pistons coatings on their uh, on, um, uh, heat treated rings coat sometimes they have even coated valves um, the materials themselves are superior. They're better material. They can hold up, all right? But the guys who are complaining about ethanol, they're complaining because they're tearing their engines down and they're seeing wear and tear, all right? They're losing power because if you took a microscope and you looked at the valve seat, you would, you, it, would look like a, it would look like a saw blade. It wouldn't be nice and smooth. It'd be really rough edged, all right? And that's with a microscope. And what's happening is that the, it, it's, basically the the micro effects of, of corrosion of rust okay and you're not gonna have that okay, I mean yes but it's like you'll be fine by 99.998 percent you'll be okay all right you can run a high ethanol count fuel in your brand new c because Rotax is using higher quality materials so Guys who say, I don't run any ethanol. Fine, cool, pay $7 a gallon. That's your prerogative, okay? But those engines are designed to run on not 100% ethanol, but ethanol mixed pump gas. Because they know people are gonna be out on a lake, they're not gonna have a choice when they pull up to a pump and the pump says 87 with 10% ethanol. And the guy goes, holy crap, I can't get home. This is garbage gas incorrect a new ace motor yamaha motor cowie motor honda motor they can all run on this stuff okay they're using better materials if you show up in a flat bottom v drive boat with a small block chevy that was built in 1977 don't run ethanol gas all right if you're sitting with a 460 pulled out of a you know a, a country squire ltd wagon that's in your, you know, your boat. Yeah, that old Ford ain't gonna like ethanol, but your supercharged CD will have no problem with it. Okay, it's the concern is the the uh, the water. There's water in the fuel. Okay, but it's it's not like, oh my gosh, water's gotten into my gas tank. My motor's not gonna run. It's gonna foul my plugs. No, no, no. It's microscopic levels of water that's in that's in the ethanol all right and ethanol only accounts for in, in some states it's only like four percent of the fuel and then other pl states it's like you know f i think it's like 13 percent in california some of you guys might have to correct me on that one but it's really it's really a a a, 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 a minuscule amount it's 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 negligible it really is a small amount so first and foremost take it from me these engines, the last, since 2004, 
These engines are designed to run on ethanol blended fuel from the pump. You're safe. You're okay. All right. And when an engine, when a manufacturer tells you a minimum octane rating, I'm going to tell you why. Okay. And the reason being is that, and, and I'm going to, I'm actually going to pull this engine apart in front of everyone. I actually got some tools and we're going to have some fun here. I'm also going to be moving the camera around. So prepare for some really crappy camera work. <laughs> You've been warned. So what happens with running a low octane fuel in an engine? Okay, here's a good example. Great example. Yamaha SVHO. Yamaha SVHO says, hey, listen, to get optimal performance, and they, these are their words, to get optimal performance out of your SVHO, you need to run 91 to 93 octane. All right, but if you look at the manual, you look up everything, it says you can run 87. You're just not gonna get optimal performance. So how can the engine know? It doesn't have a brain, right? How could, how could it figure out what gas you put in it? Well, it actually, can, it actually does have a brain and it actually can tell, all right? And what happens if you put an inferior gas into your engine, all right? And this can happen with you know, you, have you ever heard someone, and this is for you non-engine guys, I'm, I'm primarily talking to you guys, but you've heard someone say, oh, it's got, it's got some bad gas in it. I had, I had gas in the garage, I thought it was good, I poured it in, and it runs like crap, I gotta get it out of there, all right? You can limp your engine home unless the, unless the gas is completely laminated. And what that means is that literally the molecular bond of the gasoline has has degenerated and broken apart, all right? And it's actually way less combustible and you're, you have a lot of waste because there's an, it's a, it, gasoline is actually an unstable bond, all right? It's unstable, it, it's not permanent, all right? Uh, for a lot of us who uh, have to winterize our watercraft, uh, they put fuel stabilizer in the gas tank. Well, what the heck does fuel stabilizer do? Fuel stabilizer is a chemical compound that helps retain the gasoline's chemical bond, all right? Otherwise, gas over time breaks apart. For a lot of you guys who are, okay, I'll, I'll be silly, but a lot of you guys who are preppers, who are like, hey, listen, if, if there's a power outage, if there's an EMP, if God forbid something happens, um, what do I do? Well, I got, you know, I've got 20 gallons of gasoline here in my garage. I can run my car to get me to wherever um, and you maintain gasoline. Uh, a lot of the uh, prepper instructors, a lot of those survivalist guys, they're gonna tell you rotate out, rotate your saved gasoline. You wanna rotate that out at minimum every six months. Rotate it out because gasoline breaks apart, all right? So if your watercraft has got a full tank of gas and you haven't ran it in a year, that gas is likely garbage, especially if it's been outside. If it's been inside and it's been in a, in a somewhat controlled environment, um, and I know most people's garages, even if it's inside of the house, um, you know, attached to the house, uh, most people's garages aren't necessarily insulated like the rest of your house is, um, but it is a pretty much contained environment that gas will not break down as quickly as gasoline that would be in a car or a watercraft or a lawnmower or whatever that's parked outside underneath the weather in the heat. All right, that heat helps break it down. So hopefully that clears up some stuff, excuse me. So um, what do we do with, you know, what do you, what do you do with gasoline? All right, so they typically don't want you to run a full tank of gas that's been through you know that's been sitting in a ski for a year with a bunch of stable you know the, the stable fuel additive you know the fuel stabilizer you only want a couple gallons and that's only so that uh, the fuel system isn't left raw um, because your fuel pump and your pickup inside of the gas tank can actually rust and corrode and so that gasoline in the tank will keep it from rusting so that helps okay so I feel like I hit a tangent but I apologize on that one um, but when it comes to the engine and like, a, like, let's go back to our example of an SVHO. So the SVHO 
wants to run on 93 octane optimally, on 91, 93. Okay, so you let's say you go to the pump, you're out on some big lake, you gotta, you gotta get home, and you, you misjudge the distance, so you're out with a big group, and all they got is 87. You're like, oh no, what do I do? Well, believe it or not, you can ride home, okay? But your engine isn't gonna have the same performance that it did with a tank full of 93. Why so? How so? Inside of that engine, they have what's called a knock sensor, all right? Like door knock, a knock sensor, okay? What that sensor does is that sensor is paying close attention. It's literally like a stethoscope, it's listening, all right? It's listening and it's also calibrating for vibration. And what that knock sensor does is that knock sensor is paying attention to the actual harmonics, the actual beating, the vibration happening inside of that engine as all four cylinders are running, okay? And it's listening out for what's called detonation, all right? And it also is listening for, for pre-ignition. Pre-ignition and detonation are gonna be kind of the topics I, I, I really beat on today, so hang on tight for this one. So, all right, what the heck is detonation? What, what's Kevin talking about? All right, so when, well, let's talk about, actually, you know what? Let's crack open this engine and I'll actually show you. It's better to show you than tell you. Uh, first and foremost, uh, as you notice, I'm wearing a shirt for our other magazine. We, our other magazine, in addition to the Watercraft Journal, is Mopar Connection Magazine. Mopar is a term that they uh, was given to, it was actually for the, the parts department back in the 20s and 30s. Um, and Mopar is today colloquially known for Dodge, Plymouth, Chrysler, uh, a Jeep, Ram, anything that falls underneath the Chrysler brand, uh, the big Omega M that they got. And our magazine is the only online daily magazine similar in format to uh, Watercraft Journal. And we actually are partners with, with uh, FCA, with, with uh, Fiat Chrysler Automobile Corporate. So we're allowed to use the Omega M and it's a pretty bitchin' magazine. I'm really proud of it. Anyway, this is an engine I'm building for a project car. And what this is, is it, it started off as an engine block out of a motorhome. And it's the 440 cubic inch block, all right, that comes out to 7.4 liters. So when you guys are talking about a 1.5 or a 1.6, I'm messing, or a 1.8, I got a seven, the, I started with a 7.4. <laughs> anyway, but this 440 actually has a four and a quarter inch stroke crank, factory stock length, uh, stock length rods, um, which are 6.745. And then I went 30 over with the engine block, or uh, with the cylinder, so it's a 30 over bore. And what that comes out to is that, that makes this engine uh, a 498 cubic inch motor or almost 500 inch and mathematically that is just a just a hair under eight liters so um, I always laugh when I talk to guys who uh, no it's uh, 8.2 liters that's right because I have a 535 in my 69 charger and that is no that's 8.5 that's an 8.4 liter. I did the math one time, I got bored and I started doing the conversion for it because I believe it's 0.875 uh, cubes per 0 0.01 liter. I think that's correct. Because like a, um, a, uh, a 350 comes out to 5.7, a 392, uh, cubic inch motor comes out to a 6.4. So if you do the conversion on that, I think I, you know what I'm back to eight. I'm back to eight, uh, eight liters. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Another tangent. I apologize. So this is ba this is if I'm not mistaken, an eight liter, 600 and, should be about 615 horsepower, naturally aspirated, 500 inch motor. All right. Um, this is actually going into a uh, 71 Challenger with a, uh, uh, a four-speed overdrive 
and it's going to be pretty trick uh, that we're doing for the magazine. Uh, I wish it was my car, but nope. I got all my projects are in pieces and at other people's shops right now. Uh, but let's take the heads off. We're going to talk about combustion chamber. We're going to talk about quench. But uh, right now I want to talk about um, the compression cycle in a four stroke. So I've already taken most, most of the, I've taken all the hardware off so I can pop everything apart. So give me a second. top dead center but I want to bring it over to show you guys top dead center all right ah. then I'll get into the head a little bit oh let me get my all right here we go visual aids okay Again, I apologize for the moving around and everything. Okay, so let's move this down just a hair. All right, I want you guys to pay attention. This is the number one cylinder, all right? Let's move this over. So, oh, oh, oh. All right, so let's talk about, let's talk about these pistons, all right? These pistons that we chose for this engine build and again, I'm looking at, you know, a 1974 Chrysler 440 motor, and I'm talking to a bunch of guys who want to talk about jet skis. But <laughs> the architecture and, and the math makes sense. So right now, this, this piston is sitting at top dead center, all right? That means it's at the top of its compression stroke, all right? So what happens is that when the piston, and this could be a Sea-Doo, this could be a Yamaha, this could be a Cowie. When the piston reaches TDC, top dead center, that is when the spark plug, and I'm going to pull the cylinder head out. All right, so here's the cylinder head. I have put a spark plug in, and I'm going to show you on camera. All right. When we get to top dead center, when that piston gets right there that's when the ignition tells the spark plug fire Woof. all right shoots off a little blue cone of, and it ignites the mixture of gasoline and air and that's right when it's at the tightest compression stroke all right it's right at that this is as tight as it gets all right well when that explosion happens ugh, pull this down all right it put, helps push this piston all the way down, all right, in the length of its stroke. And now it's on its way back up, all right? I, I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm manually torquing this. So as that piston comes up, it's right, yeah, here it is. Okay, this, that's the exhaust. It's pushing, all right, the explosion blew it down, and now it's pushing all that back out, all right? And as it, it pushes all that out, where's it going to go? It's going to go out the exhaust valve. So the exhaust valve opens up at the same time, and it squeezes all that exhaust out. All right? The, and simultaneously, as the exhaust is going out, all right, and this is where we get into overlap and cam timing and things like that. You don't have to worry about it. But as the exhaust gets pushed out, all the fresh gas and fresh, fresh air comes in and this piston starts going back down creating vacuum it's sucking fresh air and gas in okay it's going sucking it all in all right and then as it comes up we're on our we're on our our second com we're on our positive stroke again and it's coming up oh we're back to top dead center and here we go same verse you know second verse same as the first this is what happens it just goes you know, it, it, it sucks it all, you know, it, it pulls it all in. And then as it comes up, it's compressing all that air and gas. 
real tight, and that's when the spark plug goes, boom, fire off, bam. And that, here we go, shoves that back down again, all right? And it's doing that for all these guys, all right? And it's doing it simultaneously at 6,500 RPM, making 615 horsepower to the flywheel. And hopefully I'm not losing more than 20% through the automatic transmission. That gets to the rear gear. And if I've got a good set of sticky tires, those axles twist those tires, those tires bite the asphalt. That car lifts an inch and a quarter off the ground and you run a 1098 at 128 miles an hour. Okay. <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> Sorry, I got excited. But that's basically how this operates. So let's look at the cylinder head. All right. So let's go back to our, comp let's bring it up to the compression stroke. All right. So here's our compression. It's squeezing all the air and fuel. It's super tight inside of here. And the ignition goes pop, fires it off. It goes boom, pushes the exhaust, pushes the piston down. All right, and as it comes back up, all right, that piston's starting to travel back up again. All right, you can, I mean, it's kind of hard to see it, but all right, here it, we're creeping up. Yeah, look, okay, just imagine that going really fast. As that piston is coming back up, this exhaust valve is opening up to let all that spent gas, all that, all the fumes, all the gas that it didn't burn out of the exhaust valve. Okay, then as all of the exhaust is out, this guy starts to close and the big intake valve opens up. All right, why is that opening up? Because the process of the piston pulling down creates vacuum. All right, it's sucking. So it's literally sucking in air from the outside, whether that's through a carburetor or a fuel injection or a supercharger or what? Well, supercharger is shoving air. Let's get to that later. But naturally aspirated is vacuum. It sucks in air, all right? So this opened intake valve lets all the air and all the gas get sucked past it to fill up the cylinder here, all right? Until it fills up to the brim. And then here we go on the compression stroke. Pop. Here we go again, all right? That's why, that's how it works. This is, I mean, this is basic 101, you know, pretty basic stuff. All right, so what is detonation? What's pre-ignition? Let me move this up so the top of my head is cut off. All right, so what happens here is that detonation happens when we're at top dead center right now, okay? So this is right where the spark would, the spark plug would fire is right when that piston's at the top, okay? What happens is that when the spark goes off and causes an explosion, it's literally sending shock waves through, through the cylinder, all right, through the tiny little gap that's in there. Now, what detonation is, is that at a separate point in this cylinder, a second explosion happens, okay? Something causes a second explosion to happen. Something causes that fuel and air to kick off and go. So what happens is that you have boom, 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 boom. That's knock, all right? That detonation is not in harmony. It, it, it's not from the spark. It's from something else, okay? There's a few things that can cause detonation. Now... Well, I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole of what could go wrong with your engine because, uh, again, it's another three-hour conversation. But you could have like a big chunk of carbon that gets in there, and it's basically a hot coal. And that hot chunk of carbon can, can actually just be setting off the fuel, kind of like a glow, pu glow plug in a diesel engine. All right? Um, there, there, could be a, there, there could be an actual failure in the piston or a failure in... Um, you know, in the, in the engine block or something like that to that extent. And it's, it's basically a hot spot that's causing that fuel to, to ignite at a different time and at a different pace. Here's the problem with that, is that when you have detonation going boom, 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 boom,
that can beat the crap out of even the best pistons, out of the best valves, out of the best engines. All right. Detonation kills engines. Just done. Just <laughs> kills it. Blows it up. Blows holes through the pistons. Blows the thing apart. Okay. So one of the one of the the things to worry about though is bad gasoline can cause detonation. Uh-oh, well, previously you said that you could run it. Sort of, kind of. It depends, all right? You don't want to play ball. You don't really want to play chicken when it comes to bad gas in your engine, especially a, 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 a high-performance engine. A lot of things can go bad really fast. So what do you do about, about detonation? First, believe it or not, all those stupid additives and stuff you see on the shelves at Walmart or AutoZone, all right, the gum out stuff, the, the carbon stuff, what that is designed to do, all right, and, and a lot of it works. And actually, there is, it's not just snake oil. There is some actual science to, to a lot of these additives, is that you put it in the gasoline, or it's an oil additive, but typically it's a gas additive when it comes to this kind of stuff. And it's trying to break up any carbon that be, might be building up around the valves or on the actual surface of the piston and it's trying to break it up and get it out through the exhaust get it out of there it's going to run like crap if it's working because it's going to get all that carbon out and then it'll run cleaner it'll it'll take a little bit to run it out all right um to be honest if you feel like it's running bad run some good race gas. Uh, I actually would say like, you know, throw a gallon or two of like 108, if you can find it, some VP race gas, and that'll actually do the exact same thing as any one of those additives, okay? In fact, what a lot of those additives are doing is replicating the quality of a high-end race fuel. That is not to say take your stock HO or your stock SVHO and run it on 108. Do not do that. That motor's not intended to run on race gas. You will blow the damn thing apart, all right? You'll actually tear the tulips off of your valves. Don't, please don't, all right? And I don't want anyone saying, Kevin told me I should run race gas and my bone stock ski. No, I'm saying if you're having, pre de if you're having detonation problems and you're throwing codes, that's a shade tree mechanics way of fixing it. All right. Most of you will never, will go your entire lives without ever having an encounter with detonation. Okay. So bad gas can, bad gas that's delaminated, that sat around for a long time can cause detonation if there is no mechanical failure in the engine. All right. Number one. Number two, what's called pre ignition. All right. Pre ignitions also pretty detrimental um but doesn't destroy an engine like like uh um detonation does pre-ignition means all right let me bring the cylinder head back up all right just so you know this is a this is a brand new uh closed chambered high compression trick flow head uh these are pretty trick these, <laughs> these are pretty trick um these are actually some really bitching heads that came out for the big block mopars and this is, my first, this is my first go with these heads, so I'm actually really excited to run them. Um, all right, so let's, there's your spark plug. All right, so pre-ignition. What pre-ignition means is that something is setting off the gas in the air before the spark plug ignites, all right? It's literally pre-igniting the fuel, all right? Pretty basic in the name. So pre-ignition, can be can be a couple things. What most people find is, um, well, there's a handful of reasons, but I'll, I'll go over them because it's fun. Uh, I like this kind of stuff. This stuff is is fun for me. Um, first and foremost is uh, something. Uh, basically, you're running really really hot, okay, and the engine is not cooling off. And, and I'm not saying like turn the engine off, cooling off. It, it's literally not dissipating heat fast enough. And the heat of the piston, the heat of the cylinder, the heat of the cylinder head 
is actually so stinking hot it sets the gasoline off okay that's one thing number two there could be debris there could be carbon and that could pre-ignite it too all right um that happens uh not common but it has ha it does happen in, in some cases uh but then the other thing is that you could just run garbage gasoline again and garbage gasoline here's the problem with garbage gas you know with a like junk you know you know like a really shady you know a really cra kind of crappy dock that has some gas that's been sitting in the tanks for a long time uh could delaminate um but uh why i bring up garbage gasoline in this sense is that believe it or not and i have heard about this i've seen detriments of it is that the gasoline doesn't burn or burn so poorly so inefficiently that it hangs on and it clings on to the sides of the cylinder walls and the top of the combustion chamber and then on the wrong cycle ignites again all right because it's so it's so uh, the the molecular bond is so unstable it's so bad that it's like oh okay we're gonna be gasoline again and then it goes off and that actually happens and that's just because of the volatility of gasoline as a molecular bond okay we're getting into it again um but that's why they put the recommendations on like run this gas run this so let's get back to our svho engine what does a knock sensor do all right a knock sensor is listening to the engine a knock sensor is going you know does it sound right you know okay it sounds like it's running good okay good but all of a sudden let's say you run 87 in that motor and it starts going <coughs> all right and you're starting you know you won't hear it the human ear can't pick up on it but i mean unless it's really bad but otherwise nine times out of ten it's gonna be the knock sensor that pays attention and goes hey oh, wait a minute he's got some crappy gas in this thing and what it's gonna do all right it's going to do a couple things a knock sensor immediately sends a signal to the ecu to the brain all right the engine control unit and it tells the ecu hey, hey hey we got some garbage gas in here we can make it home it's not doing anything that will kill us but we're not gonna we're not gonna run at full throttle so what it's gonna do is that the injectors will actually start increasing fuel all right It'll actually pump out more gas, washing the pistons down, just dumping gas. Your efficiency is going to go throughout the, your efficiency is going to go out the window. But why it's dumping extra fuel in there is so, uh, primarily so that you don't, or you don't, you don't detonate. It can live with pre-ignition, but detonation is bad news. So it's like, hey, listen, let's just burn this crap as best as we can and get it out. All right. What it also does is that it, it re, technically, excuse me, it retards the timing. It backs the timing off. Okay. So it's like, ah, you know, I mean, not enough. So it's like the, it's stalling, but just enough. So it's like, Hey, let's play it safe. Let's not try to run so efficient. Let's, excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, let's, let's try to run, you know, a little sloppier, just, just so that we can get home, get back to the launch ramp and, and get on the trailer and get home. All right. It's a safety precaution. A knock sensor in an engine allows for adjustment in an engine efficiency. That was a long way to get to that point. Your ACE uh, 1630 can do, will do the exact same thing. All right. Any modern four stroke engine has a knock sensor. And it's going to read how you know how the the burn and the harmonic of the of the combustion is going. All right, it's paying attention. Okay, so let's make sure I, I check. I made I made notes. I wanted to make sure that I didn't forget anything. All right. So last the last thing I want to talk about that you could change. Um, I typically don't recommend it unless you're really building out an engine. Uh, if you're just maintaining your engine, you're not tweaking anything, you're not changing, you know, the performance of your motor, you're not, you're not radically altering the performance of your motor, um, stick with the manufacturer prescribed spark plugs. Okay. 
because spark plugs can run, uh, can actually, spark plugs actually change the, their hotness. They, they, they call it hot, you know, how hot is your spark plug or how cold is your spark plug, okay? They, that, that's something a lot of guys talk about is how hot it is or how cold it is, all right? And a high performance engine, you want it a little bit colder, all right? And the reason why you want a slightly colder spark plug is because you're running on a superior gasoline. And so you don't need so much of a spark to ignite it. And if it's hotter, it's going to pre-ignite that gasoline. It's going to pre-ignite your mixture. And if you're running a high compression engine, okay, in this case, this motor is, I'm, uh, let's see. Okay, I'm 10 and a half to one compression, all right? Um, that's actually pretty standard. 10 and a quarter, 10 to one. Um, I, believe the, I believe the HO, naturally aspirated Yamaha, is 10 and a half. And I, I also think the CD is the same. I'd have to double check. I didn't check the compression, compression ratios. Um, but 10 and a half to one, 10 and a quarter to one, pretty standard. Um, the compression ratio on my 700 horsepower charger is 11 and a quarter to one. So it's different. Then you get into top fuel dragsters and they're 13, 14, 15 to one. So, <laughs> um, and compression helps in the efficiency of that burn. Okay. And the problem is, is that you start getting into more sensitive areas and then, then normal Joe blows can't, can't enjoy their watercraft because now they've got a really finicky engine that starts pushing out head gaskets and starts eating valves and and now no one will like your engine so they try to keep those compression ratios pretty standard um so what 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 changes do you want to do what do you want to pay attention to when it comes to spark plugs unless you're messing with your engine stick with the factory spark plug setting they know what temperature they want that spark plug to run at, and they also know the duty cycle of that spark plug. So just leave it be, all right? Now, here's where screwing with spark plugs can hurt your engine. Let me bring my cylinder head back up. Okay, so, believe it or not, there is a torque spec for your spark plug, all right? When you install a spark plug, they, the, uh, the manual will tell you you need to torque it to this spec if you do not you will have trouble all right well here's where it gets interesting if you do not torque it tight enough that means that the tip of the spark plug is not deep enough into the combustion chamber it means that the flame is too far away all right and if the flame's too far away it might not get an efficient or proper or complete burn and now you're running now you're running foul you're running bad all right number two believe it or not and i'm gonna unscrew this and, and pull it out i got a little i think these are ngks yeah these are ngks these are what i used to run in the charger um i might run them on these heads they're a good they're a good spark plug but i think i changed to a champion no i'm still running ngks okay um ugh. I'm not real brand loyal. I just, whatever runs. Okay. <laughs> this was pig rich. This was a, <laughs> this was a, this was when the charger was running really rich. These are all blacked out. Um, that's a lot of carbon. That black is carbon. Can you see that? Can you see how crappy that is? That's someone who doesn't know how to tune a carburetor. This idiot. <laughs> I blame myself on that one. All right. So, Here's what happens. Let's scoot in a little bit. All right. So if that spark plug is, is not deep enough, all right, that spark that happens right here, that arc between the little, the tip and the terminal is not going to ignite everything efficiently. So you got a problem. Number two, if it's backed out or isn't torqued in deep enough, believe it or not, you can get gas collecting inside of the threads. All right, because this guy indexes into a hole that's been machined to properly fit the spark plug. And if it's backed out, you're going to have little gaps in there. All right, 
and you can have gasoline actually collect in there. Well, what happens when the gas around the spark plug terminal goes off? You blow your spark plugs apart, all right? Or you're getting a spark plug moving like this, all right? And you get a really inefficient burn, a really inefficient spark. So you want, if you're putting your spark plugs in, you're doing your own service, make sure that you torque them to the right spec, all right? Listen to me. So, let's see. Spark plug, no, 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 Interesting. Uh, I had to double check this. I, I had always heard this, wasn't entirely sure. I kind of felt it was different. Um, but what's interesting about a supercharged engine versus a naturally aspirated engine, besides the sucking, all right, um, the compression cycle, how, um, let's pretend this is the exhaust cycle. Well, it, it doesn't matter. This is the exhaust cycle, all right? The exhaust is being pushed out and now, it's starting to drop back into the cylinder. And when that does, the intake valve is open and it's, this is causing vacuum and sucking in fresh gas and fresh air, okay? That's naturally aspirated. Naturally aspirated means like the diaphragm in your lungs, you're, you're inhaling, you're, you're causing vacuum, you're sucking in air and fuel on that stroke. Supercharger, is forcing it rams air and gas into that engine i'm actually getting oil all over my shirt <laughs> um so it's force feeding it's just it's like someone shoving a pizza down your throat and you're, just, you're getting shoved you know that stuff's going shoved right down your mouth so the supercharger is forcing fuel and air in okay so what and, and typically supercharged engine has an intercooler all right that intercooler is trying to shove in as, as scientifically possible as much cold dense air as it could muster all right because it's going through an intercooler and it's trying to get those air molecules to calm down not be so hot and active but calm down and collect and condense all right so it's trying to shove in as much cool, condensed air and fuel as possible. What does that mean? That means that the intake charge is actually cooler on a supercharged engine than it is on a naturally aspirated engine, all right? The atmosphere, the air, the ambient air all around you is typically warmer on a naturally aspirated engine going into the intake manifold, into the cylinder head, than it is on a supercharged engine. Um, and, that's, and that's why they adjust, they adjust two major things when it comes to supercharged engine. They adjust ignition timing and the heat of the spark plug and the compression, all right? That's why you see a lower compression ratio on a supercharged engine than you do a naturally aspirated engine, all right? because the supercharger is doing so much more of the work. So if you're messing with that kind of stuff, if you're going down the rabbit hole and you're, and you're like, hey, listen, I'm gonna put a big turbo on it or I'm gonna put twin turbos or I'm gonna blah, blah, you know, change the supercharger wheel, um, depending on the supercharger wheel that you put in your c or your you know, Yamaha or you change the wheel on a Cowie, um, then you start altering how much fuel needs to get in there because now you're shoving way more way more air in if you don't meet that with an equal amount of fuel or added fuel you're going to be leaning out your engine you're going to have not enough gasoline for your intake charge and the the actual intake combustion is lean it run, it's actually hot because the gasoline isn't burning all the air in there did i lose you on that one okay so Anyway, so guys are asking, can I run ethanol gas? Yes. Why? There's better materials. You can, you can run a 10%, 15% ethanol gas, pump gas. You'll be fine. Your four-stroke was built with superior materials. It's not going to eat up. You know, it's not a big block Oldsmobile. You'll be fine. It's not going to eat up your rings. It's not going to eat up your valves. Number two. 
all right? What about gasoline octane? Can I run 87 in my 93? Yes. Why? Because you have a knock sensor. The knock sensor is telling the engine, hey, we're running garbage gas right now. Get us home. Now, what's interesting is that let's say the standard says, oh, you can run 87 all day long. It's going to be great. Oh, okay, awesome. I'm going to run 87 because I'm a cheapskate. But let's say the day comes and you go, hey, you know what? Let's, let's fill the tank up with 93. Believe it or not, the knock sensor is going to tell this is going to tell the ECU, "Hey, we got a tank full of really good gas. Let's give it hell." Okay, great. And it's going to and it's actually going to advance the timing. It's going to lean out the fuel a little bit, and you're going to have a more efficient, hotter running, bigger punch out of your motor, okay? Believe it or not, your GTR 230 is going to run a lot better and it's going to know to run better with 93 than it will 87, even though on the sticker right there by the gas by the gas filler door, it says you can run 87 all day long and you'll be fine, all right? You can do that, and there is a difference, okay? All right, did I, I just wanna make sure I hit all the points. Pre-ignition, or, or detonation, pre-ignition, hot and cold spark plugs, uh, intake charge. Yeah. Yeah. And because of lead in gas, old gas could tolerate more heat, could tolerate a less efficient engine. Today's gas is more temperamental and cannot tolerate a really high engine operating temperature. All right. So that's why modern engines have superior cooling, superior oiling is to help wick that, that heat out of the engine, all right? All right, do we have any questions? Because I think I'm done. Um, I wanna make sure I haven't, I haven't missed anyone. I've seen a lot of watching, but I think I've had a lot of people tune in because I've been just babbling about engine stuff. Haven't really gotten any, any questions. Shoot, I actually got some uh, prizes here, so oh well. Um, oh, hey, uh, in case you didn't see, we, uh, we uploaded a new video onto the YouTube channel. Uh, we did it last night at midnight. Um, and that was on our, uh, speaking of which, our, GT, our GTI SE 170. We, we joined the Middle Tennessee uh, Personal Watercraft Club for their uh, um, Tim's Ford pandemonium ride. Well, they gave it a funny name. And we went and checked out some secret spots and went swimming and had a really good time. Had, had a really good experience on our GTI. Um, to be honest, we're absolutely loving that, that GTI. Um, uh, and I, I've had discussions with Jerry Gaddis about it and a couple other people, and everyone just feels the same about the, uh, about the new GTI. It, it really is one of the best additions that Sea-Doo has made to its lineup in a long, long time. Um, we're very happy with the hull design. Oh, the hull design is really good. Um, there's no, con I, honestly, there's no concern about the Polytech 2.0 when it comes to the, uh, uh, when it comes to the hull on the GTI. And that's been something that um, I know a lot of guys have voiced concern, like, oh, it's a plastic hull. No, no, no. It doesn't oil can, it doesn't flex. You're not getting the flex that you would at, I mean, you go out and you hot dog at tricks for a while, you can actually feel the, you can feel the ski flex. You can kind of whoop, whoop, you're like, oh my gosh. But it's because it's lightweight, it's small, what, weighs 430 pounds? I mean, it's tiny, all right? Um, the GTI and that GTI hull is double the thickness. It's, it's literally half an inch thick all through it, and it actually has fiberglass stringers through it. So um, you're not feeling that oil can, you're not feeling that flex on it. Um, and we've just been, I, I honestly, I've been wowed by it. Every person I put on, it's been like, Oh, this is great. I love it. Um, we really haven't had any complaints. Uh, ergo lock seat, still the best in the business. Uh, I will tell you, I love a bigger gas tank. Um, the 20 and 20 and a half, I can actually squeeze 20 and a half gallons into the STX. 160 LX that we've got parked on the trailer next to the GTI and Boy you get real spoiled when you got 
I mean, you go half a day and you still have only touched one bar. I mean, holy cow. Um, <laughs> if Sea Dew can shove their 18 and a half gallon tank in the GTI, oh, Nelly, that would be trick. Yeah, if they could do that, that'd be fantastic. I think that'd be a home run. Um, but otherwise, uh, it's not really a complaint. It's just a kind of wish list thing. Uh, the GTI has just really been a treat for, uh, for me and anyone that we've put on to test it. Um, and everyone I know who's in the industry who, who test rides watercraft, the GTI has been just a home run. So, uh, yeah, I really can't, I really can't praise it enough. Uh, the GTR 230 is also a ton of fun. Um, obviously it's a supercharged version of the same ski there's no difference uh, but a really fun bit of information and this is something that I might have shared before is that the intake grate for the GTIs and the GTR because they share the same hull uh, is identical to the ST3 the larger three cylinders or well the larger three seater excuse me what does that mean well we, I've talked in length about the options and, and, and what goes into a top loader intake rate and what Riva's done with the ST3 with the intake rates and that we're going to be doing a shootout of the intake rates. Well, I got a little note. I think it was the day after the video that we did. And they're like, dude, that intake rate that we have for the RXTX goes on the GTR. I was like, really? And they're like, yeah, it bolts right on. He goes, no, it doesn't. And he goes, yeah, it does. It's the same, it's the same pattern. I said, get out of here. And he goes, and we're, we're, we're seeing the same added traction, and we're not losing any speed out of the GTR 230. It's like, oh, holy crap, here we go. I mean, how do you say no to that? So that's kind of, a, that's kind of an added plus, is that the design that they made for the full-size ST3 also works on the GTI. So bonus. All right. I still haven't gotten any questions, so I'm not giving away any free stuff this week, I guess. Sorry. Um, I'm going to tune out because I think I've melted most people's brains when it comes to this engine crap. Uh, I tried to summarize it as quickly as possible at the end. Um, and yes, on a modern four stroke with a knock sensor, you can run 87. It'll get you home. All right. It's not going to be happy. It's not going to run at its best. It's always happier with better gas. Don't be cheap. But um, it'll get you home. You're not going to hurt your motor. And anything with, with ethanol, it's negligible. It really is. Um, even super, I mean, uh, again, unless you're talking to the guys who are going 110 miles an hour and they're out drag racing, they're on a different planet. They're working on, you know, they're, they're working at a higher level. I'm talking to the regular Joe Blow who goes cruising on Saturdays. So, guys, thank you again very much. Please check out the YouTube channel to check out the latest video that we did. Um, we're actually pretty excited about that one. That one, that one turned out really, really well. And, uh, again, if you can, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. We definitely want to get to 10,000 subscriptions, uh, hopefully before the end of summer. I know it's kind of a slow burn when it comes to people subscribing. But if you could, do it. That'd be great. Please share. Uh, I'm going to be sharing the video on some of the groups since it's a CDU. I'm not going to drop it on like the Yamaha or Cowie guys. That's not right. Um, but I will share it with the CDU guys. Uh, but thanks again, guys. I appreciate all of you who tuned in. Hopefully, this gets a, a more than anything. I hope this information can help out some of you guys who were curious and didn't know. Uh, we want to definitely help out where we can and, and share some useful information. Until then, have a good night. We'll see you around and take care.